So I went out to the Camaro to take a look, uh, to see what I can salvage from it. So I went to my old friend who I sold it to. And, uh, and I thought that it would be as easy as just removing the fuel pump from the rear seats uh, through like, a, like an access hole there. But it's a little bit more difficult than that. In fact, you'd have to drop the tank in order to access the pump, the sensor, and the fuel pump control module. Okay, let's talk sway bars here. Front sway bar application for the LT1. This here is an E46 M3 front sway bar, and this here is an E36 M3 front sway bar. As you can tell, much, much different construction. This here, the M3, the E36 is a lot higher than the E46. The E36 is a lot shorter, and it also is a lot narrower, so a much different construction. Now, both of these sway bars are 30 millimeter upgraded versions, and they both have poly mounts. But which one should I choose here in this application? If you look at the E36 front sway bar poly bushings, you'll see that they're curved at the bottom. That precludes you from being able to in install these on a flat surface. In fact, you need these metal brackets that you need to order specifically for BMW, modify them, weld them into the, the frame rails of your chassis, and then you have your M3 front sway bar set up. With the E46, however, you have poly mounts that have a flat bottom surface. And what that allows you to do, that allows you to take whatever type of um, thick metal, an eighth inch, three sixteenths if you want, and cut them to size, and then you can put your holders over that, and you can make studs, you can make holes, however you want it, and then this can be a weldable assembly into the frame rails. So, that is one solution, and that is exactly why I plan on going to the M3 front sway bar for the E46, this guy right here. Because not only that, but it also is a lot shorter. Now, if you install the front sway bar in this application, you'll find that the taller M, the E36 sway bar is really low because it's so tall here. So this is actually a lot sh uh, shorter. So this actually is gonna be a much, much better fit in our application. So we're gonna end up going to the E46 M3 front sway bar. But before we install the sway bar, we need to install the engine. Before we even do that, I wanna kinda of let you guys know what I've done behind the scenes because the brake system needed a significant modification in order for it to work. A lot easier to do it with the engine outside of the car, so I was able to stand in the engine bay and actually do the work. So what I've done here was basically strengthen all of the structural points where the brake system is mounting to the chassis. In particular, the two bolts, one of them is not installed right now, but both of those bolts um, have been added to uh, aluminum fixture down below there that I had welded down. So now this thing is sitting really good on two bolts here. This guy is a 17 millimeter uh, uh, shoulder bolt and that is also screwed to the chassis there. And then of course, there are two bolts here that need to be screwed down to this location here. So this is on and it ain't going anywhere. The second thing that we did was we modified and installed the ABS unit. What we did is we made a little bit of a tray for the ABS to sit down inside of the uh, of the battery pack. Now this is actually just supposed to be straight over, but I made a tray here for the ABS to sit down below. And the brake lines are very convenient to install that because the brake lines are all gonna end up being there. So the brake lines kind of come, this is from the front of the car. The brake lines kind of come down and out over the side there and they come up and into the master cylinder which needs to be cleaned because it is dirty. So the brake lines have now been plumbed and installed and they are sitting really nice. The other thing that I had worked on while I was, out, while I was doing this is of course the two lines that go from the reservoir down to the master cylinder where it needs to fill up. One of them comes around and snakes around and goes into the master cylinder rear and the other one goes into the front. So both of those lines are now, we haven't really installed them yet, but they go in to the master cylinder because if I were to just install everything now, I'd have to disassemble it because I'm gonna clean everything up, powder coat and paint everything to make this a really nice show worthy looking car. But for now, all the prototyping has been done. Everything's been um, understood, calculated and de-risked. The best way to install sway bar bushings that are really tight like this, you know, the uh, poly bushings, is to use a spreader. You wanna, get, you wanna get the spreader in first, and then you open it up, and as you open, you're gonna push, you're gonna push it on and over the sway bar. This is really, 
really taut, but that's one. And let's get this in first. Go. And there's two. Rotate them around a few times. Make sure that all the grease that you put on the bar is good to go. And now we can get the bar installed and see where it's gonna live in space. So how is Fitman on the E46 M3 front sway bar? It's okay. I, uh, I think, I hope I don't have any show stoppers here, but I think I might. Um, this is where I think I might end up putting the bar. As you can see, the width of the bar where it mounts to the frame rails on the E24 are just about perfect. So I'm not worried about that or being able to put them and affix them to the frame. The problem is, is that the width of the E46 is quite large. It's really wide. And the problem is, is that when you're going and dealing with a tight turn, you're gonna have interference between your front sway bar and the um, brake caliper. So to help alleviate this, you can always mount the front sway bar higher up as to circumvent that, but um, you need to see how the car will act in a dynamic fashion. So I don't know, this might be a showstopper for me uh, in terms of being able to use this, but um, yeah, it's just too wide. So let's take another quick look at the E36 M3 sway bar and see how that looks. With the E36 M3 sway bar, I'm trading one evil for another. Um, I have this hooked in here, but it is quite low. You can see how low it is compared to the lowest part on the car, which is you know where the steering rack is gonna be and mounted to underneath. So this is actually gonna be the lowest point in the car, which is why I gravitated toward the E46 M3 sway bar. The, M the E36 bar is certainly less narrow, and I think that I might have no problem being able to get around the, uh, the brakes, um, but um, I wanna try one other sway bar that might work here and see if that ends up making any marketable difference between the two that seem to be uh, you know, playing one evil off of another. Okay, last but not least, this is an E92 335i sway bar. And I'm actually was planning on using it for the, uh, the 8 series, which it will work in that application, but I don't think it's gonna work here. And the reason is, is because it's going to have direct interference with the steering rack. I like the fact that it kind of hovers over the lower control arm and that's what it does on the E31 too. But if you see here, this location, I can't really point to it, but that location right there is gonna interfere directly with the steering rack and the, and, and the, um, the tie rods. So um, despite the fact that the mounting locations are inward more than the, uh, than the E36, and E46 M3 bars are compared to the E24 rails. Um, I don't really care too much about the problem of you know, mounting. That would have been an easy solve. The problem is the interference with the rack and, uh, and getting this to fit correctly. So no, I don't think that the E92 335i bar is going to work either. But I think I might have one more idea. So here's basically our plumbing, right? This is the power steering plumbing that's gonna come from the rack, and we also have these two guys are gonna end up going, getting welded onto the cooler. Here we have our oil, right? This is our oil, um, and our oil diverter valve that, all, that will go to our cooler, and we have a thermostat on there for 180 degrees. We also have a creative solution to integrate the existing oil temperature sender. At the end of the last episode, I said that this was an oil pressure, but it's not. It's actually oil temperature. So we need to do a little bit of aluminum TIG welding in order to get this guy to mount onto that so we can get our oil temperature sensor. And we also have our lines going to our cooler right here. These guys here are two O-ring fittings that go onto the cooler, and then it goes all the way to the AN10 fittings, at which point it'll end up needing to these guys. And then finally, we have our transmission lines, which here have been dev devised here. This one is for the uh, output to the cooler, and then from the cooler it comes back through this and it back into the transmission. There is a mechanical pump on the transmission that actually pumps the fluid whenever the, the transmission is spinning. So basically whenever you're moving the car, the transmission sprays the, the fluid and uh, back into the transmission, comes out and goes back in. 
And then finally, we have our crankcase ventilation. This is the modified pipe that I made that goes directly into the existing PCV system. And that comes down and it will end up getting welded to an AN10, to an AN10 fitting here, which will then get underneath the, the motor mount bracket and go right into this AN10 fitting here that's conveniently located on the Holly oil pan. Another thing that we've done, we talked about this earlier in the episode, exhaust down pipes and it comes up like this and it will probably work, is the oil pickup dipstick and we had acquired one from a uh, Corvette Stingray, I believe it was a C5 and basically it sits in between the headers just like that and installs right in the Holly oil pan right down below and it conveniently clamps right here on the uh, valve cover right here. So this is basically ready to go too. So. We have de-risked a lot in this episode. Um, we have taken care of oil, we've taken care of um, wiring and harnesses, we've taken care of the plumbing for the coolers, and we've taken care of the brakes on the chassis side. So um, let's get this puppy in, figure out where everything sits, and then we can install our sway bar. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the updates that I've made since the beginning of the video. Now we're not gonna be talking about too much more about fuel in this video. We'll probably end up reserving that to next video. And yes, we are getting a lot closer to first start as we're getting all of our plumbing done. So let's talk about the plumbing that we've done up until this point after now that we've had the engine in and talk about any additional issues that are going on with that. So as you can tell, we have our transmission line coming there and our other one has now been hooked up and that also is gonna be going to an AN6 line that this guy's gonna end up coming around. So both of these guys are gonna end up swinging around you can see that one right there. And that's gonna end up going right into the transmission cooler right here. So that's pretty much well documented. Um, the second thing was the PCV valve. Um, I got the PCV drain that comes down to an AN10 line hooked up down into what you can see there is the oil pan. So the oil pan now has its AN10 line drain going into, this is a Holly, so it's gonna be going right into the Holly oil pan. So that as well is also taken care of. Oil cooler right here is going to these stock E30 lines actually is being held in by a uh, crimp connector with a Torx bolt. That comes out and around to this clamp here that secures it to the chassis. And then these two guys, which have AN10 bungs, those go directly up and over into the Earl's 1129, which also has an oil temperature sensor tapped into it. This is oil temperature, not oil pressure. I was wrong in the last movie, and now I'm glad I've clarified that with you. Thank you so much for the comments on that. The two I.O. input output on the Earl's 1129 is, I don't know if you can really see it here, there's one there and then there's one there. Those two are gonna be snaking around and going directly to those right there. So that will end up getting set up, in fact, I've already cut those two lines right here. As you can see, they have already been swaged on one side. The other side needs to get cut to length. This is on the oil cooler side. This is on the oil, uh, the Earl's 1129 side. So these are also taken care of. The only reason why I haven't terminated them yet is because I haven't uh, finished the sway bar and I'm actually going to be documenting the sway bar in the next video. It's actually got a pretty cool idea for sway bar fitment and I feel very confident about it. But the sway bar will end up being right here. And that sway bar is going to end up interfering with these in some way. So I gotta figure out the best way to snake these guys around. Perhaps it might go up and over, something like that, and then snake around. So I gotta figure that out. The final thing is the power steering. Now the power steering, two lines go here. I am not going to be welding AN10 fittings onto these aluminum outputs because when you torque down an AN10 fitting, it needs to be, the 37 degree flare is actually going to be pretty tight on there. So I didn't want to um, twist these relatively thin tubes by torquing down on that in order to get them to swage. So I'm actually going to be using, uh, since it's all low pressure here, one's coming from the reservoir and one's coming from the low pressure on the steering rack, that I'm actually going to just be doing uh, hose clamps on these. So that's gonna make things a little bit easier. Um, so that's basically steering. Now, we did take apart the steering rack. You can see right here, we did take apart the steering rack and took the, uh, took the pinion out, right? We took the pinion out in order to weld on here. Now, the reason that we're welding is because of the act absolute tight clearances that we have right now on the, on the rack itself. So you can see if I unscrew this, I've already welded one 
Um, this is actually an M14 by 1.5 thread. It's a bung that I've welded on. And I'm actually waiting on the M16 by 1.5, which is the larger side. This side here goes to the, rat, the, the cooler, and this one here is the high pressure side that goes directly to the pump. The pump is right here, and that is not installed yet, but that guy is right here. And this guy basically connects a uh, NPT fitting with, a, with a, a, a copper seal, and that goes to also a 45 degree AN6. Now, as far as the AN6 fittings go on the high pressure side, we are not going to be using this kind of a typical normal rubber hose with a stainless steel wire wound uh, liner. This is actually gonna be high pressure since it's coming from the pump directly to the rack. So this guy here is actually going to have a PTFE style connection actually, similar to what we're gonna be doing with the clutch line. So this PTFE connector here is gonna be a high pressure um, uh, plastic nylon lined um, application which is uh, gonna require different fittings as well. So I'm waiting for that to come in which is why I haven't lined that up. And finally, talking about fuel, we're going to be getting there, I promise, but we are going to be grabbing that fuel pump actually from that Camaro. I need a better convenient time to drop that tank and get all the parts that I need in order to adapt the fuel system to the E24. So guys, having said that, I am out of here. Thank you so much for watching and stand by for the next part coming up this coming week or next week. Not sure when, I don't know, I don't even know. I have no idea. It's gonna happen when it happens, guys. Thanks for being patient. Later.